I understand that some of the terms used in this video can be offensive for some viewers, especially the Aboriginal people. These days, people refrain from using these titles and identify Aboriginal people by their rightful name. However, back then, the laws referred to Aboriginal people as Aborigines and half-caste. Therefore, for historical context, I shall refer to the names of the laws as they were written. During the 1900s, the Aboriginal populations of Australia were subject to some of the most stringent laws governing a native population. The goal of these laws was regulating the lives of countless people and integrating them into a white society, often with brutal methods. In today's video, we will be covering the use of a particular settlement in the pursuit of these goals, which encapsulates the methods employed to forcefully and violently integrate a population. It is important to first note the term Aboriginal will be used to refer to those with ancestral birth ties to Australia and those who were seen as black by the white inhabitants of Australia. Official figures released in 1921, which were later greeted with a level of scepticism, estimated the Aboriginal population being as low as 75,000. Many people in Australia believed the Aboriginals to be a dying race, and as one, incompatible with the white way of life. This is a sentiment that was present in the press, with the Perth Sunday Times writing, Central Australia's half-caste problem must be tackled boldly and immediately. The greatest danger, experts agree, is that three races will develop in Australia. White, black, and the pathetic, sinister third race, which is neither." End quote. This official concern can perhaps be best noted in the long name of a piece of 1897 legislation in Queensland. A bill to make provision for the better protection and care of the Aboriginal and half-caste inhabitants of the colony. After several pieces of legislation were proposed, the 1905 Aborigines Act was eventually enacted to make provision for the better protection and care for the Aboriginal inhabitants of Western Australia. This legislation authorised a position known as the Chief Protector of Aborigines. This granted that appointed individual the position of legal guardian of every Aboriginal child up to the age of 16 and stripping this responsibility from a child's biological parents. Power over these children was extended to the authorities, providing specific permission to send and detain the children in institutions and in service with the education of Aboriginal and mixed-race children being enshrined. These children would also be subject to detainment in institutions, industrial schools or orphanages. You may have noted that the word authorised was used there, not created. This is because from 1898, the role of the Chief Protector had been filled by a man named Henry Charles Princip. A man whose background included, but was not limited to, estate management, horse rearing and the civil service. Princip held the role without legal authority until the 1905 legislation formally established it. It was argued at the time that it was the state's responsibility to protect mixed-race children, with enough supervision and training from the state's institutions could lead a future of useful workers. Princip felt limited prior to 1905 by a previous piece of legislation with the same name, the Aborigines Act of 1897. Lacking the parental consent or legal powers to enact, this frustrated Princip, reportedly making him feel powerless to address the ill-treatment faced by the members of the Aboriginal tribes. With the 1905 Act, Princip was finally given the authority he so craved. He alone had control over the upbringing of Aboriginal children, and he would decide what would be in their best interests. Large numbers of children, predominantly those that were mixed-raced, were removed from their Aboriginal mothers, with a particular focus by the authorities on separating those that had lighter skin. A 1997 report into the history of these children, titled Bringing Them Home, observed that the exact number of these children is unknown, but it was at least 100,000, and they were subject to forced removal from their parents in often brutal fashion, sometimes as soon as the child was born. As can be expected, many families took to hiding their children whenever the police arrived, not wanting their children to be taken to any of the institutions. 
Parents that attempted to prevent their children being stolen were held in police bays as a consequence. A common approach taken by the parents of these children was to blacken their skin. This was done by crushing charcoal and mixing it with animal fat and smothering their child in the substance. Many well aware of the state's preference for lighter skinned children. Many children were nonetheless caught, separated from their parents, and placed into homes, missions or settlements in line with the aims of the 1905 legislation. One such settlement where the children could end up was the Moore River Native Settlement. The settlement was built in 1918 near the headwaters of its river's namesake, and around 80 miles north of Perth, Western Australia. The area had initially been intended to act as a farming camp, but was repurposed to house the Aboriginal people after it was deemed unfit to grow crops. It soon became a twisted amalgam of a prison welfare hostel and a dumping ground for the elderly and destitute members of the Aboriginal community, notably young mothers. The settlement was established by Chief Protector A. O. Neville, who took the position in 1915. Neville firmly believed in the notion of breeding out the colour from the Aboriginal population and to raise the children as if they were white, with the encouragement to marry people with lighter skin tones. The aim, over successive generations, was to remove the Aboriginals from Australia. The aforementioned Bringing Them Home report commented that many of the people within the settlement were there for rehabilitation with a perception that the police would effectively round up Aboriginal people. This would include those guilty of alcohol-related offences, who would simply be sent to the settlement as opposed to face the same legal punishments of their white counterparts. Other reports have referred to much of the settlement being treated simply as a dumping ground for Aboriginal people who were poor, old and sick with nowhere else to live. The settlement has retrospectively been described by some as a convenient hiding space for a perceived problem that could not be properly solved. The children housed at the Moor River settlement were subject to education and work training so that they could be able to function in a white society. As workers, they were trained to live as domestic servants, offer factory, farm and station work. Girls were trained in domestic labour and partook in sewing classes. Whilst education was apparently treated as a high priority, school time for the inhabitants of the settlers was only about three hours per day. The buildings in which the children were expected to sleep were dilapidated and often overcrowded. Many lived in the most basic of tents or shacks, exposing them to the cold winters. In some instances, the shelters were little more than tree branches with a piece of canvas draped over the top. If there was a sense that there were insufficient resources, the influx of more people only exacerbated the situation. During the Great Depression of the 1920s and the Second World War almost two decades later, the lack of funding was made all the more apparent as resources all but evaporated. Even in later years, when dorms were built for young girls, young men and married couples, it was not enough to deal with their poor conditions. With the amount of people living at the settlements, all of these dorms quickly became overcrowded. Day-to-day -day life at the settlement was heavily regimented. There was strict segregation by age and sex, with children separated from their parents and their siblings. Leaving their premises was strictly forbidden, without express written permission to do so. Many of the male inhabitants were trained as trackers for the anticipated escape for those who wished to return to their original communities. Despite this segregation on these characteristics, it should be noted that no such segregation or separation was made in relation to language or culture. Due to poor conditions and forcible placement, many of the settlement's inhabitants attempted to leave the settlement. In 1923, a 3.5 square metre shed was built to punish those who attempted to escape. Many of those who tried to escape were children looking for their parents. The shed was named The Boob, which although now sounding comical, it was anything but. Little about the specific treatment of the individuals forced to remain in this shed is known, such as the length of time they were expected to remain in there, or even how the food or water was provided. Time spent in the boob would have been incredibly hot, inside a small metal shack that would hold the heat, acting more like an oven. 
The boob was also used in conjunction with other abuses at the settlement. Many of the inhabitants were often severely beaten and subject to S.A. It was reported that Superintendent A.J. Neal would beat, whip and commit S.A. before imprisoning those within the blistering hot shed and many of those being children within his care. Simply leaving the settlement having been trained to integrate into white society was not necessarily the end of one's stay at more river native settlement. Many of those that ended white society found themselves abused. This only created a vicious cycle leading to their return to the settlement often where women would return pregnant. The Moore River Settlement would report some 374 deaths with 203 of them being children. And 149 of these children died under the age of 5 with a large number of these being less than a year old. Many of these deaths were from conditions that we know to be treatable, such as pneumonia, tuberculosis and malnourishment. One particularly grim example was that of a child that was only 8 days old when she died of bronchitis. It was not until 1964 that the 1905 Aborigines Act was repealed, and in 1974 the Moore River Native Settlement was eventually closed. Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, apologised on behalf of the Australian Government in 2008 to the Indigenous Australian population. He acknowledged the mistreatment of the Stolen Generations, which he described as a blemished chapter in the nation's history, referring to the separation of families and communities. The apology also came with a vow to close the gap in relations to life expectancy, educational achievement and economic opportunity. In the years since the Stolen Generations, different regions of Australia have engaged in legal cases and compensatory action. For example, Western Australia allocated the sum of $2.5 million in compensation over the course of nine months. But more recently, a case was filed against the West Australian government by Aboriginal elders for what they claim to be stolen wages from labour in the 1930s and 1950s under the impression that this was for the purpose of reintegration. The history of Australia's treatment of Aboriginal people is far longer than this single video could ever possibly hope to cover. And whilst this piece has touched on some of the background and eventual apologies, for the stolen generation, it has nonetheless focused on a single settlement that occurred during a specific period of Australian history. There are plenty of stories of the brutal massacres and further discrimination against the Australian Aboriginals. The Moore River Native Settlement is far from the only settlement of its nature and we will be covering more in the future. During my travels in Australia, I spent some time in various cities and went to some of the museums which highlighted the horrors of the Stolen Generations and the White Australia policy. If you ever happen to travel to Australia, I would recommend having a walk through the museums and seeing the stories of those affected by such cruel policies. <laughs>